earlier on, um, it wasn't just writing mm. that I saw as part of a political project. And again, I think it's probably the same for you as well. We, we were both actually engaged in mm. various emancipatory movements at the time. I mean, I'd been involved in a campaign about um, uh, prisons and women in prisons you know, in, at one stage. And then I was involved with an organization called Rights of Women who were producing documents and engaging with issues. And um, I, I think at the time it was felt really, really important to bring those kinds of politics into our writing. So the mere fact of looking at, say, issues of gender or look, in your case, looking at sexuality was itself, you know, pretty radical. Mm. And then to do it with a particular kind of perspective, a political perspective as well. Mm. And again, I think it was important in both of our, our works that for people to understand the situation of, of women or sexual minorities or whatever it might be at a given time, you had to have some kind of background to it. There was also a lot of um, antipathy, of course, mm. towards Foucault. And I think one of the really sort of significant issues around feminist scholarship at the time, of course, was um, adopting a slightly different analysis <coughs> of power. And that really did create quite a, mm. a, a, a divide, I think, in the feminist movement about how power should be understood and, and issues of power. And my perspective on that would be that the adoption of a more Foucauldian approach actually allowed us to move forward mm. to some extent and to, to see some, the greater complexities of power and also to start to shift away from the kind of victimization kind of ideas of, of, of uh, how power operated. Because there is a sense in which that understanding of the, the, the structures of society and, 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 and how they have come about and how they operate and uh, various elements of it, before you can kind of move on to, um, I'm explaining that maybe chronologically, but perhaps it doesn't have to be like that, but before <coughs> you move on to that, that more nuanced understanding of those everyday interactions. Otherwise, I think you get a bit stuck the way that um, Goffman w was ultimately quite problematic, notwithstanding his work has been terribly important and, and mm. so on. But somehow you need that. I mean, and obviously that comes from a Marxist approach and, and so on, and that kind of work that was, was, was done then. But I suppose in my own work, I got a bit fed up banging on about the structural. Yeah. <laughs> and because I was also, when I did sociology, social interactionism was quite a big thing, and I just found that so fascinating. Again, and that does borrow from Foucault, mm. of course, but, but that way of conceptualizing, it's no good having these ideas uh, just for themselves. They're meant to be explaining things yeah, and assisting people to under, understand things, I think, because I think there was a phase at which I did become very theoretically oriented and was trying to work through a number of ideas. And, and that was also the, a sort of key socio-legal phase where I, I was stamped as a feminist jurist prude mm. of all things. Um, and, and, you know, doing that kind of work. But it did start to feel, what is the point of this? And, and in a way, what, what I think is quite interesting, and, and I'm not trying to be divisive here, but obviously feminism also was taking a turn. I mean, theory became more and more important, and then there was what is referred to as a sort of cultural mm. turn. And quite a lot of feminism did become incredibly theoretical. Mm. And, and, and in one sense, I found myself at that point really wanting to turn back again into just talking to people. Because again, I think what was interesting is, is certainly from a feminist perspective, for an awfully long time, you, you never taught a course on the family. Oh. Um, I didn't, be, I don't think I taught it till I came here probably, which is kind of interesting. One did courses on sexuality, one did, uh, I did courses on the body and so on, because there was a sort of sense in which, although you might be talking about the same issues under these other headings, it was never going to be the family because that, that in a sense, had, had become identified in a certain kind of, 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 of way. And, and one actually did act, want to be able to see difference. There was this kind of notion of what those courses should be and what was of interest, which didn't fit with, I think, what, what most people were interested in or what they were doing or even the lives of some of our students and so on at the time. So, so I, I, I do actually think that was quite an, in, an, an important shift at the time. But it also enabled us, I think, to start bringing in, back in, the sorts of things that 
we thought was important, yeah. really, in everyday life. And <coughs> There was very much a sense of context for intellectual excitement and a sense of what you can do. And I think, I think for us, there was a sense that this could be a particular kind of beginning that we could stamp in different ways. So using David's name was really very important for us and, and hopefully for him because um, it, it, it was, we really wanted to capture that incredibly rich history that was reflected in, in his work. There was also a breadth, of course, in his work. His work wasn't only, as we've heard this morning, on families and so on. It was obviously um, wider than that. But we felt that would give us a particular kind of freedom as well. The other thing that it enabled us to do, and I really feel that this was a fantastic feature of what's happened here, um, was we didn't just have to focus on uh, family and relationships, we had this very strong methodological arm mm. as well. And part of, I think, what the Morgan Centre went on to do, whether we quite planned it in this way is another matter, but what happened was we started to think of other ways of doing research that could facilitate the, the, the emergence of other kinds of ideas or ways of representing um, people's family, everyday lives, personal lives and relationships. Although in the height of feminism we all talked about collectiveness. I've never really felt it until about, you know, 2005 when we came here. And we really, really did work very collectively. Um, and I think started to generate a different kind of knowledge. I also think we attempted to bring that into not, not just our work, but also tried to create a slightly different kind of sociology. Because one of the things that I bang on about until it's a bit boring, um, but, but my thing is, how do we write about the personal? How do we write about the lives of others? What is our, in, in one sense, is an ethical responsibility to represent lives rather mm. more fully, but then that actually brings in its wake uh, a set of issues, but how do you actually do mm. it? So uh, writing in and of itself as a sociological practice started mm. to become very important to me, and I suspect other colleagues as well in the centre. It started the minute I really started to do empirical work, even though I probably didn't know it, when I was meeting people so very different from me, mm. who saw the world so very differently. And um, in, those, in those times, if people saw the world very differently, there was a tendency to think that they were wrong. Um, but I've always had some difficulty with that. Um, and I think it then, then grew. And then once you're doing work on children, you have to, in a sense, you have a particular care. Mm. Because, ag again, as Al Alison here will, will tell you, they don't tell you straightforward stories. And um, so you've got, to, you've got to listen very hard mm. to what's going on and, and how you sort of represent that. It's, it's almost a physical kind of experience. And it's one of the things that I sort of, it's why I always feel that as soon as you do start to really listen to people, it changes you. And, and that's the impact it's had on, say, our politics mm. and things. <laughs> Um, when I wrote my first book, um, and probably my second and third and onwards a bit, they all tended to have the word feminist or feminism in the title, and I remember saying, and I would never, ever, you know, step away from that. Um, that's, you know, I would always want that stamp on everything I publish, and, but I have stepped away from it. Um, and. Um, in, in a way, there is two things going on. Um, I think one is that sort of sense of if you actually do want to bring certain things forward and have people understand certain aspects of social and personal life, uh, sometimes that label is a, is a problem. Mm. So I did this kind of balance and thinking what mattered more, being able to speak to certain constituents or, in a sense, maintain a badge. But of course, at the same time, the movement mm -hmm. was changing, becoming something different. Um, and uh, But on the other hand, I think what replaced a lot of that kind of um, collective action, that those kinds of political debates that, that you and I were both involved in in our various spheres, was actually the empirical work that I was doing. It, it, it became filled with much more meaning. 